Hi, Nina. Good morning for you. Good evening for you. We are waiting uh, for our panelist, Dr. Nand Kumar, to join. Uh, in any way, we will start in two minutes and it will be uh, go on. Hi, Ritu. Everyone. Hi. Hi. Hi, Nina. This is Bhavna. Hi, Bhavna. How are you? I'm very well. Good to meet you. Same here. And as, <laughs> as well as Dr. Shivakumar and uh, Nagesh and Amit. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet all of you. Hi. Hi. And uh, very good afternoon. So uh, while Dr. Nand Kumar will join us, uh, because many participants had already joined, so we'll start and uh, uh, he'll join uh, in a couple of minutes. So a uh, very good afternoon. And uh, my name is Ritu Rana. And on behalf of Helpage India, I welcome you all, all the participants and the panelists for joining today's discussion. Helpage India is committed for the cause and care for the elderly and is making this efforts towards this for the last 45 years. Today, on the 10th October, that is the World Mental Health Day, this is an opportunity for all of us to unite for the mental health for all. The theme for this year's Men World Mental Health Day is Our Minds, Our Rights. That is, and also that mental health is a universal human right. So we know that older persons are at higher risk of uh, mental issues and developing mental issues due to various physical, psychological, and social changes. So these are there are evidences that shows that if there are community interventions, we can deal with these issues and at, at an early stage and can refer and manage the uh, mental health issues in the older populations and that to the in the community at a, at a very effective uh, range. So we will hear from our experts here on this mental health day, that is mental health and elderly awareness, acceptance and addressing. Let me introduce to you all, to the speakers. We will have with us Dr. Nand Kumar, who is a professor 
Psychiatry, Ames, Delhi, and also in charge of Center for Advanced Research and Excellence, Neuromodulation and Mental Health. We have with us Dr. P.T. Siva Kumar, Professor and Head, Geriatric Psychiatry Unit, Nimhan. Dr. Siva Kumar is also the Nodal Officer of Vayomanas Sanjeevni, which is an outreach initiative of Nimhans for the healthy aging. Vayomanas Seva, that is a national initiative for skill training on dementia and mental health for caregivers of older person, and also the Telemanas, which has been, uh, which was lost, uh, launched last year by the government of India. We have with us Dr. Amit Dias, who is an epidemiologist and geriatrician, and also an assistant professor, Goa Medical College. We have Mr. Nagesh Kapuri, the Director, Ripples of Change Foundation. Uh, Mr. Kapuri comes with a management profession with 24 years of experience and actually led many programs for the vulnerable communities in across the group. We have with us Ms. Bhavna Isser, who is CEO and, and founder of Caregiver Sathi Foundation, a support system for caretakers. We have Ms. Nina Clifton, a team leader for Care UK 247. Care UK 247 is a group of leading healthcare provider in Cambridge uh, Shire providing care services. And we have with us Mr. Prasad Shivalkan, who is the Director of Corporate Affairs, Cheva Pharmaceutical. I again welcome you all, the panelists and the, and the audiences who have joined on this day with us. Uh, so uh, I'll have some questions, uh, which is a, which are very interactive, and we'll come back to you again uh, with the, another question. I'll have one first question with uh, Dr. P. T. Sivakumar. Uh, Dr. Sivakumar, can you? because uh, you have been working in the space of geriatric psychiatry and mental initiatives in the community for, for many years. Can you just uh, give us an overview? What are the some common mental health issues among the older persons and how community interventions can support in this? Over to you, Dr. Sivakumar. Thanks, uh, uh, Ritu, and for the team to uh, organizing this uh, program. Uh, Say, so, uh, whenever we talk of older adults, elderly, uh, the mental health issues almost uh, one uh, say one fifth of them have diagnosable problems, but more importantly, uh, a large proportion of them have subsyndromal mental health issues, uh, whether it's depression, anxiety. Uh, these subsyndromal health conditions, mental health issues, also affect their well-being. So, if you go to the community, uh, there is both this undiagnosed mental health conditions, which are uh, say the Na National Mental Health Survey indicates almost more than 90% of them don't get diagnosed even for syndromal health conditions. The Longitudinal Aging Study of India indicates almost one third of elderly have depression, depress significant depressive symptoms. Around 7 to 8% have uh, depression. So the recent uh, Longitudinal Aging Study of India uh, Diagnostic Assessment of Dementia had estimated nearly around, uh, say, 8.8 uh, 8, uh, millions, uh, which is around 88 lakhs of people in the population of 20, uh, for the population of 2016 to be having diagnosable dementia. Uh, and much more uh, proportion will be having uh, mild cognitive impairment. Almost around one-fourth of population above 60 have some or other cognitive disturbances. So all these things are going to influence their uh, functioning, influence their well-being. So the uh, community approach is to, is one is to promote more. awareness and recognize these problems. The second, uh, so that we can ident promote early identification and early intervention. The second is to uh, empower the community to provide the initial level of support. So that is something very important. And the help should be available in the primary care level. So that is what uh, they, uh, most of them do not reach the secondary and tertiary care. Only the severe people reach uh, 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 say secondary and tertiary care. Uh, organizations like HelpAge, which runs the mobile health uh, uh, services, uh, should actually uh, pick up mental health problems at the community level and provide service. So I think the training and other things are important. I will stop here at this point of time, uh, Ritu. I hope I have addressed the question what you have uh, raised. If anything more to be added, I will uh, get, come back. Thank, thank you, Dr. Siva, that uh, you have uh, given us that overview that one third of the older population have one or the other mental health disorders, and there are 
uh, the the community interventions at the at the ground level has to be uh, done for uh, their uh, well being now i'll come to dr amit who is an epidemiologist and uh, i'll just ask that how frequently do you see that the major mental disorders occur in late life in terms of prevalence and incidence so that the new and the old cases and what are some of the social determinants of mental health in older adults dr amit yeah so i think uh, what you asked is what dr shiv kumar said is is perfectly right because uh, one there is a lot of people who have a problem uh, but at the same time we also now have a lot of evidence of what can be done for older people with a mental health issue the issue is that this science is not reaching the community and we need to kind of bridge that gap 90% as he rightly said of people who have a mental health problem do not know that they're having an issue and that they therefore they're not really coming forward for care and that those are the social problems that are, that are really uh, causing the problem one one of the biggest issue that we that older people are facing now is that the family system is kind of breaking up so at one point of time we had a joint family system and if anyone has an issue there would be someone who's taking care of them but now the family system uh is is not as strong as it used to be in order to give to provide care and therefore we need to innovate we need to innovate to make sure that we try to strengthen the family to look after older people with all kinds of problems whether it's dementia or depression or any other mental health issue uh loneliness is a big problem when covid came i think that's one thing that the all older people took a hit because of the social distancing which was good for covid but was very bad for older people and so we we saw a lot of people who lived with fear and that really took their mental health even made it even worse and that had to be kind of addressed and during these times we had developed some of our own initiatives to be able to creatively reach out to people by uh, sending um, non specialist healthcare workers to the homes to be able to address that issue so there are various things poverty uh, family uh, uh, and uh, loneliness with, which which is kind of uh, affecting older people and 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 the number of uh, people with mental health issues are on the rise thank you dr amit so uh, mr nagesh akarthuru you have an enriching experience in managing large community interventions and uh, many programs including the mental uh, well being uh, even in uh, during the covid time rocf has engaged and uh, collaborated with health patient india and supported in creating an enabling environment in some of the older homes uh, in delhi ncr so what are uh, your some of uh, your learnings and experiences that how uh, do these elderly accept and are aware on the mental health issues you have that uh, experience of working with old age homes in that okay there is uh, one is uh, i totally sync with the, what the first two panelists have said whether is dr shil kumar or dr amit when it comes to i think paucity in terms of support uh, the whole support system at the community level and uh, as we reached out to more and more old age homes we realized that even the caregivers sometimes lack the essential skills i mean they may have the skills related to basic geriatric care but when it comes to the mental health aspects of it we realized most of the caregivers or caretakers uh, weren't really oriented on that aspect of how to manage that well or even helping in early detection of uh, any mental disorders Uh, so i think we we felt that that's one intervention that needs a lot of attention at the same time we also realized that the caregivers are under a lot of stress because of the nature of work they do um, and the trauma i mean you know they see right in front of their eyes the idea is what do we do to help the caretakers i mean in terms of how do we provide care for the caretakers itself that we that became another component that we decided that we need to need to look at in terms of ways and means to address that see per se uh, what we realize is uh, the old age homes again uh, i think there is a combination of elements that affects them the very fact that they are at an old age home itself at times uh, gets them to believe that you know they have been sort of isolated they have been abandoned or sometimes they just the very fact that they're old and they think they're helpless a whole lot of things whether it's loneliness whether we call it lack of companionship uh, or any form of intellectual engagement that's needed or in general a sort of a boost to them in terms of trying to make them understand that uh, they're not left behind a lot of these things we felt were uh, things that needed to be addressed at that level so we sort of uh, in our learnings uh, we realized that a combination of uh, recreational therapies uh, whether it is trying to help their cognitive stimulation 
or bringing in art, sports, theater, age group specific to help them overcome. This is one area we've, we've seen work very well. On the other side, we've seen intellectual companionship because most often it's these lack or loss of a sense of purpose. Uh, the fact that they don't have some intellectual companionship, someone to help them, uh, you know, with some very essential, like even teaching basics like technology, discussing books, discussing current affairs, a whole lot of things that help them really feel good, wanted and grounded. Third area we also realize is health and wellness is a very broad area, but then we realize in this space, uh, cuts across physical, mental, emotional uh, and spiritual well-being. And this, again, these are addressed in bits and pockets by the service providers. And a more holistic approach would help because we believe uh, it needs to be more or less in line with what helps them get over the problems they're facing. With simple therapies, again, whether it's laughter therapy, tai chi, yoga, therapeutic yoga, or meditation, or a whole host of such things, or helping them with nutrition and stress. But I think it's a more holistic approach that we believe. Is a sort of a small gap that we've seen, and what we could do to make bring in a more 360 degree redressal system will help them, right? And of course, the last most important point I mentioned about is the caregivers. The idea is how do we bring about and create compassionate caregivers because they're the ones who surround the senior citizens 24 by 7. And what could we do to make them, uh, you know, a breed of uh, a generation where you know every moment they're dispelling more love, more compassion. And who also understand and detect mental Ill, you know, illnesses at a very early stage. So I say it's a combination of this, Ritu. So I would rather stop short here if there are any questions or, or anything that I need to provide further clarity on. I will jump in again. Thank you. Thank you, Nagesh. Uh, this is for the audiences. We have a QA section here. And if anyone has any question uh, to the panelist or to the Help Page India, please post in the QA session section and we will take uh, as the time permits uh, during uh, after the uh, uh, the session is uh, over now i'll come to miss uh, nina so uh, nina you have you have heard that nagesh has talked and we we also know that a lot of care planning is required which is a personal center care planning and you have worked in india and in now uk for last many years so what do you see that how this your uh, uh, your organization care uk 247 which i believe what nagesh is said 24 into 7 required uh, care planning and which is what uk 247 uh, is providing so how does the team develops a personal care plan and who are all the in involved in the process whether it is a person the family or the caregivers as well nina over to you Hi, everyone. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, yes, thank, um, Dr. Ritu, uh, in UK, like, um, it's like a teamwork. Um, we involved general practitioner, social worker, doctors, consultant, um, and um, like nurses. It's like a team. And uh, families also, some people, they don't have family and uh, like then the social worker, they have to make a care plan with the, you know, the responsible people like a team leader or um, nurses or manager, they'd make a care plan about their needs. And especially the most important thing is before we start this uh, care job as a caregiver, we all get trainings. That is really important. Before train, without trainings, we cannot do care. So we get the care, uh, care trainings, and then then you can start working with the elderly people or any care healthcare sector. So it's like a, if you have a training, you know what you have to do. It's help you to understand the person's needs. They, what they are, I mean, how to say, like their emotions, what they want, what they need to care about. And uh, in care plan, we do all their, um, like, um, we establish their routine with the consistency of a person so, uh, to get the trust of the elderly people because they don't trust easily 
because they are already suffering with the mental health issues and their other uh, problems, medical problems, their loneliness, and uh, they usually do the isolate them. So social workers, they get involved to get them the proper care through the care sector, through the doctor, through the nurses. And uh, as a caregiver, job is to make sure that they are patient with them, to understand them with the empathy. And uh, they help them with their routine. And in living care especially, the caregiver is fully responsible for the person who they are looking after. They start with their personal care, their meals, their medication, and uh, their shopping, their grocery shopping. They deal with their finances. But for all this, uh, important is the documentation. We do the documentation to help the professionals to uh, get the real scenario, what the person is going through and how they can get the best care for the person. And uh, we have uh, volunteer care as well. The people, those who are lo lonely, they come and they help them. And uh, we do the activities. We have an activities group as well, professional help um, to promote them safety and uh, give them, you know, the so they can feel that they are having a normal like life like they used to be. And I mean, um, important is to encourage, encourage them. We do encourage them for the independency and, um, and give them like, a, we go for shopping with their likes and dislikes, what they like, that is really important. We just can't force on them that you have to do it. It is like what they like, what they don't like. And uh, the professionals, we get the professionals contact with them through the GP, through the social worker. And it's like a teamwork. It's very, I mean, organized. Everything is interlinked with the council, with the GP. Paramedicals, they get involved with, you need any emergencies. So you don't need to, I mean, it's very systematically, you can say, <laughs> because I worked in India as well. So I know that's why I'm saying this. So everything is very organized. Um, yeah. yeah, at the moment, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. So, yeah, I do understand that this is a team work and uh, it involves uh, everyone, uh, starting from the GP, the nurse, the caregiver, the person himself and, and also the family uh, and, and the community and, as a whole. Mm -hmm. And a lot of uh, uh, you, the team, uh, encourage independence of the person they try to yeah. encourage them and uh, for what is required is the, a lot of training for that is required. yeah a lot yeah so and I'll we do upgrade you. every year yes. yeah sure Nina. so i'll come back yeah. to you uh, with another question uh, yeah. now we have been talking Thank about you. lot of lot of care giving caregivers and this uh, space so we have with us, Ms. Bhavna Isar, who is founder and CEO of Care Kiyosaki, a very uh, unique uh, platform which actually empowers the caregiver, right? It's it's not uh, providing only the caregiving, but how how do we train, how do we take that empathy and for the caregiver support? So, uh, Bhavna, uh, I'll just uh, ask you to give us overview, how do you prepare uh, the caregiver for their emotional stress, the resilience, the endurance, and uh, what uh, is uh, like the journey of the caregiver, and you are providing that support into that journey. 
Thank you and delighted to be here, excited to learn from everyone. I do think that a lot has been already said, uh, much that I would have liked to say as well. So uh, I'm going to try and see if I can add or build on what people are saying. Uh, one of my favorite things these days to say is, think about a term equivalent to a caregiver in any of the Indian languages. It is quite likely that even if you did a quick Google search, you will come up with terms like Dekhpal Karta, Sevak, Sahayak, or Timardar. None of these terms are terms that you will use for a family member. So the idea of a caregiver that you and I are as a family member is not even a term in any of our languages. What does that mean? That means that the role of a caregiver is deeply embedded in who we are, our identity. So I do what I do because I'm a good daughter, a good son, a good partner, a good brother, sister, etc. Now the thing with it being my identity is it's very difficult to step out of this, right? It is who I am, wherever I am. So if I am a good daughter, I'm a good daughter at all points in time, I am also a caregiver, it becomes very difficult for me to let go of this. It also becomes very difficult for me to take support for it or to accept that I'm not good enough for my loved ones. Yeah, in a meeting, someone beautifully said, uh, the only term that I can use for a caregiver, a family caregiver is apne. Now, those of you who know Hindi might be able to relate with this term and I find it gives me goose flesh every time. Apne just means my loved one, mine, right? So the people who are mine care for me in a certain way that has its own implications. And, uh, you know, Rosalind Carter said it first and didn't <laughs> and said it best, which is there are only four kinds of people in this world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. Now, many of us will be in not just one of these categories, we will be in all of these categories. And the thing about aging is that this is going to be the first really significant generation that is going to live as long as it will live in the history of our planet. So what that means is that we don't know geriatrics as well as we know some other things. So to me, it is about getting into the unknown. Right? There are more and more people lasting the 80s and the 90s. We don't know enough of that. So what happens when you get into the unknown? Right, And that is the challenge for us as caregivers. When you're going into a dark alley and it is the unknown, you need information. So you need to equip yourself with information. You also need someone who can hold your hand so that if you trip, somebody can hold your hand. And there's nothing like community or someone else to hold your hand, to assure you. And if you trip and fall down and let's say make a mistake, then somebody to help you, support you, an expert. And if you're going into the dark alley of the unknown of aging, you will also want to discover the joys of aging. Frankly, I think it's a great blessing to age, to live long. And we have put tooth and nail in our science to last longer but we have ended up with many other consequences, for example, that have been highlighted, which is that aging also comes with a certain isolation. It comes with helplessness, to quote uh, Nagesh. It also comes with, um, you know, uh, with uh, losing one's faculties and more importantly, losing one's significance. So nobody likes to be insignificant, right? And I think the core of everything is our primal fear that I will not be important or relevant 
for the world in general or for especially for people uh, around me. So I think caregivers need to uh, perhaps learn to sensitize themselves to these changing needs of those around us who are aging and Uh, we lost uh, Ms. Bhavna for a while. Uh, by the time uh, she joined, so I'll just uh, summarize what uh, Bhavna was saying. And uh, I agree with what Bhavna I said. Recognize that that Bhavna, yeah. I'm sorry about my connectivity. It is also important for us to recognize that those who are aging have a lot of value to offer. It is up to us to engage with them in a way that they can share their wisdom, experience, and value. You know, I'm often reminded of my grandmother who was restricted to her bed. And uh, the calm with which she taught our family to be patient and to be, um, you know, to, to, to be able to look at adversity that our family was facing was something only an elder could teach us, right? So to summarize, I could go on and on, but to summarize, I believe that it's not just we who are caregivers to the elderly, the elderly are caregivers to us as well in some different ways. And perhaps it might be meaningful for us to recognize those ways as we build our relationship. I, I agree with you, Bhavna, that uh, it's not that we care give to our elders, but yes, elder seniors also support us and also give care and support to, to the entire family. And I like that quote that all of us are in the journey of four types of caregiver. Whether I, I am the caregiver, I will be caregiver, I was the, the caregiver, I and someone will caregive for me. So, so everyone will be in all the four phases uh, in one point of uh, lifetime, in one point of time. Uh, with this, I'll come back to Dr. Uh, Siva Kumar and uh, I'll, because uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Siva, we have been observing that these community interventions can, can actually uh, help in early identification and in, uh, in, in the appropriate care of the older persons on the mental health issues. And Government of India had launched this uh, Tele Manas, a platform to provide mental health care through 24 into 7 Tele mental health services. And Nimhans is the nodal uh, center for that. And as you are the nodal officer for the for Nimhans for uh, this platform, I would also uh, request you to provide an overview how a person, an older person who is in a remote village, can connect uh, to the Tele Manas and what are the services available in the telemanas yeah um, so the, uh, yeah thanks ritu i think uh, uh, so I, I i need to mention here that i uh, i am involved in telemanas to the extent of providing support for the geriatric care my colleague dr uh, navin this is the ministry of health and family welfare government of india program dr navin professor and head of community psychiatry he is the main nodal officer for the telemanas at a national level and at a, it is a program which is a one of a kind because it has been launched by the ministry as a major public health initiative to kind of bring mental health care closer to the community. And with the use of technology, with the collaboration of triple, uh, IAT, triple ITB uh, as an institute which provides technical support and linking multiple mental health institutions as well as government of uh, uh, state governments across the country. So it's available in all the states and it's available in multiple languages. So people can, and it is also something which is linked to the public health program, which is the district and mental health program. So uh, the, the, the this program already has a, a completed kind of one year now. Uh, and uh, it has been rolled out in most of the states. That itself is a big success and lacks of, I think more than three or four lakhs calls have been received as of now. 
and uh, uh, what i have uh, uh, i think still we have to expand it in a manner in which it is strengthened to provide much more meaningful uh, kind of uh, services uh, where it can actually end to end solutions can be provided the program has been envisaged in a way from a person who is having a problem can call the first line responder uh, who will be able to provide the basic level of intervention they are trained in different aspects and if they require a medical kind of a help or a psychiatric help then they will be guided to the next level of uh, uh, service provider including this higher level of intervention by a clinical psychologist and psychiatric social worker where a professional kind of intervention even for non medical or non psychiatric help is also required even that has been envisaged and so and people will not be able to receive all the help through only tele so it has to be interlinked with the public health system which is the district mental health program i think district mental health program has covered almost all the districts in india so uh, from the graded uh, kind of exposure from uh, 1982 it started and with uh, in 2000s uh, it has expanded gradually uh, now it is i think it is available across 700 plus uh, districts uh, in the morning there was a program with the health ministry where it was told almost all the districts are covered but uh, from the prevention to rehabilitation services have to be available in the district level with the goal what has been set out in the uh, what has been assured in the mental health care act as well as what is uh, uh, given in the national mental health policy these are some things which we still have a long way to go but the basic framework is available so telemanus will be able to link a person who has a problem to the uh, first level provider as well as a specialist care through this tele psychiatry services <laughs> and further linking with the actual mental health services is also available now how much elderly have utilized this not much uh, the data what is available with us as of now uh, uh, we still need to promote lot of awareness i think there is uh, with respect to elderly uh, uh, say uh, the, the problem is that there are uh, uh, say uh, what we have so far what we have got the number is total calls are around 10427 this is a couple of weeks back we had get the, got the data and uh, uh, 60 to 80 years uh, predominantly male 61% have male uh, have, have called and uh, um, say most of them were routine calls uh, with very 2% of emergency assistance and with 18 80 plus years also people have called and the range of complaints are sleep disturbances medical issues sadness of mood um, stress related issues aggression so substance use related multiple things have been uh, the whole range of things including suicidal ideations so there were there are people using it but compared to uh, the population which is uh, nearly 10 crores uh, where we expect at least uh, uh, 15 20% of them have some or other mental health issues uh we still have to create more awareness and so that people can seek help through this forum also and uh, as, as any technology oriented interventions elderly will have a challenge in terms of both awareness and access uh, so ngos like help age india and various other uh, uh, stakeholders who are part of this program and who are listening should promote awareness about this uh, telemanus service um uh, so i think this is uh, uh, in the next years in the next few years we would be seeing more uh, specific we would be enhancing uh, the training program for uh, uh, telemanus uh, for the all this uh, i think more than thousands of uh, uh, people are manning these centers and imans would be coordinating with other centers and conduct training so that more people can actually uh, uh, be it. equipped to provide mm-hmm. services for elderly so mm-hmm. i i think the information is available with respect to the the number what are the uh, i will i will just uh, sh- share it in the text message what are the what is the number what people have to call uh, i will stop here at this point of time uh, thank you dr sivakumar while you message the number can you uh, can you call can you the number so that people who are listening Uh, can have that number now or you will just uh, post it I, i will i will i will i will share it i will share it i'll share I'll it hmm? yeah, 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 yeah 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 
Ma'am, you are on mute, ma'am. You're muted. We have been uh, waiting for Mr. Prasad, who was disconnected earlier. So, Mr. Prasad, uh, uh, now uh, I have a question for you. There is a large need for community interventions, starting from raising awareness to psychological aids and care support. So, in your view, because you are coming from the CSR, the corporate world, and uh, what is the what are the steps uh, CSR is taking in this uh, direction in the mental health issues? Sure. So first of all, uh, Dr. Ritu, uh, thank you so much and uh, my uh, sincere appreciation to HealthPage uh, for conducting this session. And this is really a very uh, important topic on important day that we are discussing upon. Uh, from CSR, uh, ESG, what we uh, refer here, our corporate social responsibilities. Uh, Teva has started uh, doing this uh, from last couple of years and our one of the major focus area is uh, mental health and especially in India we uh, observe that uh, therefore means all experts are there so I will not be getting in more deeper in this uh, topic because uh, they have already this um, information and awareness about but uh, uh, there is a social stigma in uh, our Indian society for mental illness and uh, to come out from that, we have supported one uh, cyber wellness center uh, in Goa. That is one of its kind first cyber wellness center. And uh, uh, main focus is, uh, earlier we wanted to give the name of cyber illness center, illness uh, uh, cure center. But then we realized that because of the, um, uh, the social stigma, we will uh, refer it as a cyber wellness center. The modus operandi of this center is uh, all these uh, team of uh, which is consists of uh, psychologists as well. They visit all these schools because of the cheapest uh, internet data and internet uh, uh, addiction is one of the uh, major cause for the uh, mental illness. Uh, specifically, as Dr. Shiv Kumar mentioned uh, in the beginning, that post COVID, because of all of our students, they are having more access to uh, internet, easily available internet rather. Uh, so they visit all these schools. Uh, we are covering three lakhs fifty thousand school children, college going student uh, students in Goa State, and uh, they just deliver them the awareness about the um, uh, internet addiction and etc. While talking, they realize or they identified some students that they are actually addicted to the uh, internet. This then they approach their parents. And very uh, in uh, uh, confidentiality, um, maintaining the firewalls uh, in uh, system and etc. They reached out to their parent through the uh, uh, student, and then they start the uh, cure of uh, this issue. So this is one of the uh, uh, project that we are already started. We are entering in third year of uh, this particular project. We are looking for further uh, uh, project which can we can capture and support the mental illness. And yes, there are huge scope from the uh, corporate side that we can support as much as impactful uh, 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 mental illness uh, project. Thank you, Mr. Prasad, and uh, I I wish that uh, Cheva and other uh, corporates uh, move ahead in the space of mental health and provide that support to uh, the organizations who are working in the mental health and uh, it's for the entire community, including the older persons. With that wish, I'll come back to, uh, again to Dr. Amit with my question that, uh, Dr. Amit, uh, you are you have been working in the community uh, and into yes. the community health interventions. So, uh, what in your uh, view and your, in your experience are the level of awareness and acceptance of mental health issues among the older and their families and in the entire community? Yeah, so I have been working in the area of uh, older people, especially in the area of uh, genetic mental health. And uh, the first uh, area that I was working with is Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And we found that uh, majority of people uh, did not know that they were having this condition. So 90% was the actual gap as far as awareness is concerned. And uh, this is despite the fact that around 55% of them had gone in the last three months and seen their general practitioner. And yet they didn't get the diagnosis. So the awareness is not only... 
Am I on? Okay. The awareness is not only among the general population, but it's also among the medical fraternity. So there is a big gap that we kind of need to close. A lot of things have happened since then. We have raised a lot of kind of awareness to, to be able to um, help people understand these conditions a little better. The other issue is as very well highlighted is there is no local term for most of these mental illnesses, whether it's depression or whether it's dementia, there's no local terminology for this. People feel that this is a normal part of aging and so nothing can be done about it, but they need to understand there is a lot that can be done and we can improve the quality of life. So this is the kind of awareness that we're giving that, that life does not end with the diagnosis of a mental illness. We, there's a lot that can be done and the first step to, to getting that help is to get a diagnosis. It's very important for people to understand the science of mental illness and, and be able to come forward for, for the diagnosis. Two, it's important to, to close that kind of a barrier. If, if they have to go to a psychiatrist who is very far in some kind of an institution, they because of stigma and all other reasons, they may not end up going there. So is it possible for us to uh, improve the capacity of primary health care to be able to make this kind of diagnosis. And if they require referral, they can, they can be referred. And this is exactly what the National Program for Healthcare of the Elderly is, is, is doing. We have started geriatric clinics in primary healthcare. We have started health and wellness centers and the health and wellness centers can actually be, uh, can increase capacity. I'm not saying it is happening right now, uh, but the aim is to train people to increase capacity to make this kind of a diagnosis so people can get help at the those steps. At the same time, non-specialist healthcare workers, the multi-purpose healthcare work workers, male, female, ASHA workers, the Anganwadi workers can be trained. There are several projects that we have done where we have trained them to see whether they can provide um, care and, and, and see what the impact is. And we have found a tremendous amount of impact that they have made. Non-specialist healthcare workers can be trained to provide care to older people, even if it's as complex as, as something like dementia. In dementia, we did something uh, as simple as what we call CARE. C stands for caregiver support. So the first thing, if you want to take care of an older people or older person, you have to address the issue of burnout in that caregiver. We need to address the issue of trying to balance care. Very often it is that one caregiver who is taking care of an older person with a mental illness, at the same time doing the shopping and cooking and doing everything possible. We try to get other people to try to help that caregiver do other work and balance the care support in, in that family. So it helps in a big way to the caregiver. The caregiver also feels respected, feels acknowledged, and feels like they, as they say they have been doing this work, donkey's work for so many years, and, and I don't even know what it is like, so thankless, and at the end of it, people come and, and, and call me names. So uh, by trying to address these issues, we can bring about a lot of, lot of changes in, in that family, and we improve the, uh, so that is first care, care uh, taking care of the caregivers, uh, a was activities of daily living can assist the families in helping an older person with the activities of daily living. Um, R is reminiscence that we were trying to do in, in because it was people with dementia. And e is try to make the environment much more friendly for people with mental illness. So this is how we need to go forward. What we try to promote is what we what, what we say uh, try to keep people happy. And happy reminds us of the fact that H is for health. We need to ensure their health. We need to ensure that to check if they have diabetes or hypertension and address the health-related issues because we don't address the physical health problems, we will not be able to address the mental health problems because they're all interrelated. A in happy is active. Keep people active. In, in a project that we did called the DIL project, it, it stands for prevention of depression in late life. And in this, uh, behavior activation was something that we found to be a very powerful tool in order to prevent a depression in late life. As, as one of the speakers rightly said, we, uh, Dr. Shiv Kumar said that. You no, know, it's, it's not only about the diagnosed conditions, uh, the people with a diagnosis who have a problem, but also we have something called sub-threshold uh, conditions. So we address people with sub-threshold conditions and try to see if we can actually prevent depression in them. And by having trained um, uh, non-specialist healthcare workers, we made a big difference in their life and we, we were able to actually prevent depression in, in older people. So simple interventions can make a big difference in their life. So H is health, A is active, P is give them a sense of purpose, P is also peace of mind. If there is a compromise, they need to make sure that don't, don't compromise your peace of mind. And why is tell people about yourself? You know, you need to give self-care. 
self care is not the same as being selfish all the people have really spent their life in taking care of the family and cooking and taking care of the grandchildren are really burnt out but they need to also understand the need to make time for themselves and self care is very very important so if they keep these h a p p y words in mind they can try to achieve good mental health and and stay happy uh thank you dr amit so you have uh, given two new terms for us which is bill one is uh, the dementia in late life bill is a new project and, and the, the term for the bill and a new term for happy so h a p p y right so this is um, health age purpose Active. and for purpose yeah. peace and you yes so so these are is a two uh, two new terms uh, we have uh, learned today and by your conversation and uh, what others are saying uh, there is a possibility to fill the gap in mental health care services by sensitizing the non specialized workforce and the community health workers so this is what we have all been talking now so i'll come back to neena and uh, you have talked about uh, dr amit uh, dr siva kumar and everyone else has talked about the 24 into 7 care giving right and this is what uh, to me, to keep the elderly the person at that stage a happy active right so uh, neena to you there is a concept in uh, in uh, care uk 247 concept of live in care and waking nights live in care waking nights so this no. was a very very uh, good term i could find out uh, in your organization so can you explain to this to all of us what is this and uh, what the how does people live in care waking night um waking uh, it's like living in care it depends uh on the it prioritize and the, they assess the people who need like sometimes you uh, you know people they start walking at night and uh, they start doing the things at home they can break the things they can put the fire on so like this kind of you know they assess them that uh, people they don't want to go in a care homes they want to live at their own home so in that case people they start uh, you know social worker they arrange for their safety and their you know to someone has to be there to look after them so that's how the living care uh, caregivers they stay with them make sure they are safe they are in a i mean in a good atmosphere i mean they are not at risk so caregiver always there i mean they do the documentation what the person is doing time to time is there any um like uh, they, if they find any thing which is risky so they can contact the paramedics and they come and then they can sort it out the thing so that's why it depend on the risk assessment they do the risk assessment the easy term to say risk assessment it depends on risk assessment and then they do the living care yeah it means the the concept is that the social worker is uh, with the with the person caring given him at uh, at the night doing all and the even night, the Yeah. Yeah. Whatever are required. And, Is it that? Yeah, and with the consultation with the GP and other uh, team, they do the uh, risk assessment, and after that they uh, decide that this person need the living care or because it's the finances as well. So the whole system, HMRC, and uh, Every everyone get involved for the care package. They get the care package for the living care. To be very honest, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you, Nina. Uh, Bhavna. You. So this is a this is a concept. I think we have this a similar concept, but with a different name. And uh, uh, so in the caregiver space, and 
what do you see what are the resources uh, which are available in open domain and what the concept nina was uh, talking about do we also have the similar kind of uh, support system for caregiver i'm not talking Thank about here for the person for the caregiver totally you know uh, we live in a we live in a culture where the the stories and the narratives are that an ideal caregiver is someone like shravan kumar or savitri or ram you know that kind of creates the pressure of a certain gold standard of caregiving that you are a good caregiver if you can do this that and the other so we have to be mindful of that that we live in that social norms pressure um one two Uh, we are also under the pressure or the myth that women are better caregivers uh, i can say for sure in my home for example men are better caregivers certainly better than me uh, but you know it's a myth to think that just because uh, you know one gender makes somebody a better caregiver i believe very strongly that it's merely a matter of practice so just like you get better at tables and math by doing more practice you get better at caregiving by doing more practice so uh, and both men and women can do it and people of all ages can do it now having said that and given that as the background i think it is very important that caregivers tell their stories you know stories are a great way of um, creating new narratives and understanding what is governing us we have seen over a period of time even through films and advertisements films have moved from mai tulsi tere angan ki to piku and whatever else today so the kind of stories that we are hearing and telling is impacting us it is very important therefore that caregivers tell their unique stories without shame now on caregiver sathi platform we listen to the caregiver stories and encourage them to tell their stories without making them stories about victories and valor and sacrifice etc we tell them to talk about their stories about their challenges and struggles and uh, difficulties as well but we listen to them without judgment and with compassion so telling our stories becomes the first important thing to do you could also tell your stories in an anonymous way through our podcasts called caregiver diaries the third thing is that there are many things that are changing in our environment so modern day urban living is very different somebody pointed out that the family system is changing now we have new types of families which are smaller which are fragmented sometimes there are three people in a family living in three different continents uh, that doesn't mean that people care less it's just that you are a long distance caregiver so you need to learn new things what we have on our website for example is multiple handbooks that people can access and use so that you can build your support systems for being a long distance caregiver for example or for being a working professional who needs to manage a demanding job as well as access uh, you know care for your loved ones and sometimes uh, we need to recognize that we could be caring for older adults on one side and young children on the other and there might be a few animals or pets to throw in the mix and the maza so what that makes the adult <laughs> is being pulled in different directions and you know you might be in your 30s and 40s which might be the peak of your career so you know your boss also wants something extra out of you so everybody is pulling you in different directions now how do you balance and manage that many people get burnt out like someone pointed out so there is a burnout and i think therefore it is very very essential that caregivers learn something called emotional mastery which is recognize who you are and where you are and what your capabilities are build your support system or infrastructure learn how to negotiate with your family members as well as to share the load i think it is very important many times caregivers feel that they are 
responsible, especially women, and they are supposed to do it all by themselves. So learning how to ask for help and learning how to say that I need to learn a new thing, I need to do this differently, I need to go to a specialist, are all skills that we need to learn in order to build our endurance. And finally, of course, having practices of self-care, like someone pointed out, include things like um, healthy nutrition, uh, exercise daily, my care, uh, because I need to be healthy and strong and resilient, both physically and uh, mentally, in order to provide good long-term care, which I might need to do for myself a few years down the line. I read some lovely research recently which said that uh, someone who is who reaches 49, the age of 49, without a significant medical ailment is very likely to live up to 92. When I read that for myself, I almost fell off my chair because it means a full life ahead. It might as well be healthy and I might as well not have, uh, you know, ailments and issues or at least I'm best preparing for them so that I can be of help to others. And whoever is caring for me can also be, uh, you know, can also find it easy to care for me. There are many, many more things I can say, Ritu, but I'd like to just keep it for now. Sure, sure. We love to hear you, Bhavna, and then your course, uh, the, the examples you give from the from day to day life. But yeah, we have uh, many many panelists, and we want to hear from uh, Mr. Prasad. So uh, Bhavna said something about the burning out of the employees and long distancing distance care, and also the, I'm not talking about the long term care, but the long distance care where. Uh, the person is uh, at overseas and the parents are in another country in India and how to care about that. So uh, I'm just thinking, I'm um, talking about some, is there a uh, the platform in you have seen in your organization or in some other corporates where they have a platform uh, uh, to de-stress uh, the employees and also support their parents? Prasad? Yeah, sure. So we have a platform for retracing, a global platform rather. And this, uh, we effectively using it since uh, pandemic rather. Uh, but no, uh, as this point of time, we are not that much advanced that we are giving some uh, retracing uh, uh, platform, providing retracing uh, platform to the parents of our employees. Uh, yeah, and this is very good idea, rather good thought that I will definitely um, uh, take it ahead to our HR and then if they can really design something on that ground as well and uh, we'll try to uh, implement here as well. Uh, thanks, Prasad. Uh, Ritu, uh, now to uh, uh, Nagesh. Nagesh, you have a platform, Voice of Care where the people can uh, can have can give their voice and uh, can uh, the psychosocial counseling can be provided so please tell us about something about this platform and uh, and and uh, is there any volunteerism for the platform and how a person can volunteer uh, for that support connecting this platform to the older person yeah thanks uh, ritu for bringing that up um, so this voice that cares platform was set up uh, more or less at the time of wave two of COVID. That's when I think the National Disaster Management Authority and NIMHANS, um, more specifically NDMA, uh, reached out to various NGOs to help urgently set up additional helplines because they were running short of not just physicians, but even psychiatrists and psychologists because they were in short supply. So at that point of time, uh, we set up this helpline and it continues to run even till date. And uh, Per se, on this helpline, we it runs 24 by, I mean, sorry, it runs 365 days a year, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., uh, all days of the week. Uh, predominantly, this helpline, uh, you know, offers support service in English, Hindi, Telugu for now. We're going to add Tamil and Nepali and a couple of other languages. People will be curious why Nepali in India, but there's a huge Nepali-speaking population in the Northeast, and Northeast, uh, in fact, a state like Sikkim, where we expect uh, which is a lot of pristine nature all around, has 8% uh, 
uh, of the population affected due to mental health issues. So we sort of trying to work and help support them. So uh, coming back to the helpline, uh, right now it's entirely, though of course we do have a small percentage of paid resources, but 90% of the resources on this are volunteers. Now these are, they are picked up from all walks of life. Starts from the ASHA to Anganwadi workers to the general public, could be a homemaker, could be a doctor, could be a lawyer, could be anyone who's got a little free time. We do, of course, a fair amount of pre-screening before we decide that they're eligible enough to be a so-called uh, uh, PFA, yeah, a psychological uh, you know, first aid counselor. Uh, and then they are also put through various trainings. Uh, in fact, Nimhans has been good uh, during the time of Dr. Shekhar Kasi to put together this whole PFA training for us. And so we actually have a uh, you know panel of 16 master trainers who on an ongoing basis are training potential volunteers who are interested. As on date, we've trained 900 volunteers, out of which at any point of time, 150 of them are active. That is, they are on the helpline available 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. to provide these services. And uh, as on date, we've received uh, uh, calls from, I mean, if you say in terms of unique callers, 15,000 callers have called until date. And we've provided counseling for about 56,000 sessions. So it would be 15,000 callers, but 56,000 sessions means that the, sometimes the caller has called more times. So on an average, uh, the unique callers are 15,000, but the sessions are 56,000 plus. Uh, in a way, it's cut across all age groups. Incidentally, we've not had a very, I mean, it's a very minuscule percentage you know, calls from the elderly above the age of 60. We haven't had it. Probably one of the reasons being that we haven't publicized it in that space because we were trying to first get our act together and trying to address uh, the other segments. But we intend to definitely make it available to the senior citizens for support. Now, this helpline predominantly is about 90% empathetic listening. What we realize is people call in for a lot of mental health related issues. It's depression, anxiety suicidal thoughts and tendencies, you know, issues on molestation, issues on issues at home and uh, children not happy with their parents, the whole lot, the whole lot. There's nothing that we've missed out in terms of category of calls we can receive. Uh, luckily, we've also realized from our own analysis, 90% of the calls have been handled well enough for the caller not to call back again, which means that their problem has been addressed. They had a listening and empathetic ear to listen to and they really feel that they've got the solution they need and only the rest that call back i think that has gone up to a percentage we've seen what we call as escalations where we feel someone needs real counseling from a qualified psychiatrist or a psychologist we've seen about 10 percent of those who call back need that elevated level of counseling and we have something called level two and level three and all of this as on date and will continue to be provided free of cost what we've realized is only when it comes to a stage we feel that this caller is at a very aggravated state and needs one-on-one -on -one counseling and needs face-to-face -face counseling and needs the peers and buddies to be a part of it. We then request them to go and approach a more professional certified counselor because online has its own limitations, uh, whereas a face-to-face -face has the other elements. So understanding body language, the family is together and a whole lot of things. So overall, uh, I think in a small way, uh, we've been able to uh, address this gap. Incidentally, the Callers, the maximum callers, 40% of them are from the age group of 18 to 30. And this is what worries us a bit. It's the young population that's the highest callers. Uh, but anyway, we're hoping that we'll be able to address this. But Ritu, if you allow me, I would like to digress a bit to your question because I've spoken about why is it cares and if there are questions we can feel them. But I think we were going back to the previous conversation about caregivers and a whole lot of things. Uh, I think, uh, you know, this by 2050 as per one of the Lancet reports. It said that the Indian population, the age, the ones above the age of 60 will touch 20% as per one of the Lancet reports. Now that's that's a big number considering in India, the population of 1.4 billion. I guess the compelling need at this point is while, what were we trying to do at Voice That Cares or what all of us in this forum are trying to do is help the preventive and the curative aspects of it. I feel a lot more focus needs to go towards the preventive side because caretakers, caregivers come in all forms and sizes, right from a child to a youngster to a general physician or a practitioner who really is not able to diagnose. Everybody across the society needs to be made a stakeholder in terms of understanding the importance of putting compassion in action, the importance of being a caregiver because in every form they contribute to the well-being of the elders. And I think it's a combination of putting everyone through a psychological first aid training, 
uh, whether they're a student or a teacher or whoever, it needs to be done at all levels so that we're able to identify mental health issues right at the very initial stages. In fact, as an experiment, we've tried this trainings in uh, creating awareness programs in Sikkim with the government of Sikkim and various schools. The teachers have been trained and students have been trained. Students are trained to identify if any of their friends are showing symptoms of depression, quickly flag it to the teacher who's trained on a basic psychological first aid and upwards. So the idea is that the whole system, all stakeholders in the system are sensitized and maybe at the even right at the school system, if I feel they can make it a mandatory part of a social giving, social learning thing, that everyone needs to go through this thing of compassion and action and how we show compassion towards elders, towards animals, towards plants. I think it becomes a far more holistic thing and we'll be able to probably prevent a ticking time bomb that comes before 2050. Right. I'll stop here with this, Ritu. Sorry, I had to digress a bit, but I felt I needed to address this thing matter, which has come out caregivers, caretakers, and the shortfall of them, and how we could address this much in advance. So I'll stop short here. Thanks for your time. Uh, yes, Nagesh, this is very important, and I was about to have this uh, uh, this conversation on, on the prevention of mental health, and uh, I would like uh, Dr. Amit uh, to respond to this, that how can, how can a person or how can we prevent the mental health issues and the consequences of the mental health disorders? Yeah, I think it's a very important thing, and I fully, fully agree with uh, what Dr. Nagesh has been saying. Uh, prevention is definitely better than cure, and we need to kind of address these issues much earlier on. And we have, I've been fortunate to be part of the uh, Lancet Commission on the Prevention of Dementia as well. So it's not on, uh, it, we can actually, we now know that if we actually address some 12 risk factors, we can postpone the onset of dementia or even prevent it potentially. Um, and uh, and these are some things that are very much doable because uh, what we now know is what's good for the heart is good for the brain as well. So you just need to inculcate exercise, brain healthy activities, keeping your brain active, uh, bank on that concept of neuroplasticity and try to uh, try to learn something new and have fun. As I said, the happy mantra that I've given earlier, keep that in mind always because that's really going to kind of push you. Uh, our work with the pre prevention of depression trial, which is the DIL uh, study, showed definite evidence that if we have simple interventions that empower older people to take their health in their own hands, that makes a big difference. And we have been trying to do this in various ways now to try to encourage older people to try to put, um, to take their own health in their own hands, not to kind of depend. The problem is, you know, they say, okay, uh, there's no one to take care of me. My son is very busy. I don't feel like asking him. So is there plan B? Can you try to do it yourself? That, that's the question we ask them. And, and, and there is a solution always. And that's what made a big difference and, and gave us the impact, or gave us the output in, in the DIL study. What we have done is, um, as Dr. Nagesh was talking about schools, you know, we try to encourage school children uh, and we have a program called Mind It Initiative for, for school children, wherein we try to encourage school children to adopt a brain healthy activity. One of the idea is to, in the long run, hopefully this is going to prevent, uh, you know, brain related diseases like maybe dementia or maybe stroke, etc. The other thing, and which is very important, it sensitizes school children to mental health problems in older people. And if they have an older person in the house who's having maybe signs of depression or is having dementia, they can tell their parents, you know, this is what we have been told in school because children learn very fast. Initially, I used to do it in, in class seven and eight, uh, but now I did it in, in class third and fourth also. And the, the children just pick this up. They, they're very good learners. And it's something important for them to learn and they can apply and it can make a big difference. So Mind It is kind of that in initiative to be able to, uh, to help children um, identify older people with, this, with an issue. The other thing that we have started is something called the Magic Monday or the Memory Cafe. Uh, again, it is on the same lines that um, um, and empower people to, to run the program. So this is something that came up from seniors themselves. They said, okay, if we need to keep our minds cognitively stimulated and we need cognitive stimulation, uh, how do we get that? Where do we get that? So can we do it ourselves? So before COVID, we used to have a physical session. People would come together and we would have brain-related exercises. Simple things, like if you, if you, you learn a song, now we would want you to learn this, uh, sing the song without looking at the lyrics. Uh, and now we will step it up by giving you, you sing the song without the, looking at the lyrics, but at the same time, do some actions. 
So you need to step it up one by one. And they, they really have fun doing these kind of exercises. And the various kinds of exercises. We can have word games and crosswords and, uh, and dance. And we have something called Move to Prevent Dementia. And we come up with various things. We have various workshops for people to learn. Right now, we're we are having a session called Mind Your Language where they're learning Portuguese. Uh, but we'll be, we teach them various other languages as well. Uh, they, they learn things like macrame. They learn uh, a little bit of gardening. So various things that, that they, they would want to stimulate their, their brain. So during COVID time, we had to go to the Zoom platform and that actually worked on even better for us because a lot of older people could now join in. People from Bombay, Portugal, uh, USA and different parts of the world actually join in in the Zoom session every Monday that we have um, for, for uh, trying to promote ha happiness and trying to keep them cognitively stimulated to prevent, prevent dementia and kind of we walk the talk and put our research into practice. So the take home message is try to be happy. So health, activity, have a purpose in mind, peace of mind, very important and prioritize yourself. You know, that self care, very, very important. Uh, if you keep these things in mind, you, you can uh, focus and you can reach your, your happiness. Uh, and always ask for help if there is need, you know, the, the best intervention to, to address the issue of, 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 um, of mental illness is to talk. When, when the WHO came up with the theme in 2016 on depression, they said, depression, let's talk. Because it's very, very important that a person with depression needs someone to talk to. And you can find that person you need to talk to. And um, if you don't find out, we can, can come up with various platforms like these, like Sir was talking about, or the platform that I'm talking about, and try to connect. Because there is help available. You just need to seek for help and try to avail that help. Uh, yes, Dr. Amit, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, very important that let's talk about if there are some issues and uh, help is available, but the person has that courage and uh, that uh, unless until we talk about uh, the, 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 the illness or the something, uh, a problem, then uh, we can't find the solution. So solution is there, but you have to talk about that. And prevention is better than the cure. What is what is we all have been talking uh, 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 there's a last lap of questions and then uh, the, before that uh, I'd like to share with the audiences the helpline number for the telemanus which is if anybody uh, or anyone would like to write please write a note down this is 1800 uh, Ritu, Ritu, can we just tell a short number 14416 is easy to remember so, okay. there's a little so, number so but I think shorter is 14416 yes right that and uh, do we have uh, your number, uh, Nagesh, uh, for your voice of clear number as well? Yeah, it's 8448. Again, 8448 I'll repeat, 8448 8 That's called voice that cares. I think so we, we, have, we can also uh, add the helpline, no, elder helpline 14567. Yes. I think that, that is, is the elder line. The elder line. Elder line. Elder line. One, four, so five, we six, have seven. three numbers here where seniors or the anybody from the community or the caregiver would like to uh, call and take the take the support. One is the elder line, which is one four five six seven. Another is the telemanus line, which is one four four one six. And third one is the voice of care. Uh, which is ROCF uh, helpline kind of uh, support, which is 8448 So Anybody can have uh, and call these uh, lines. So before closing, uh, we would have last uh, few questions. Uh, I would like to uh, know uh, from you, Dr. Siva Kumar, that what are the, some of the common challenges which elderly and their families face in accessing the mental health services? Uh, Ritu, I think we have talked a lot about uh, various possibilities, both from prevention to services, uh, including tele-technology related support. I think what we need to understand is 70% of the elderly are living in rural areas. Uh, illiteracy is something very huge. And even in rural areas, there's a lot of migration to cities. And even in rural areas, we now see people who don't have the strength of joint family system. So many of these things... Uh, it, uh, uh, whatever we are talking about, it can actually translate into meaningful programs only when it uh, gets integrated with the public health and public services. 
and uh, policy level changes and it is it should be uh, uh, implemented in the rural areas i think that is where as a, most of the challenges is there at cities there are at least some level of services available some level of awareness available but i think the biggest challenge is about uh, in elderly is illiteracy and lack of awareness this requires a consistent action consistent in in in, in, in uh, with demands uh, we have been doing this vayo manasa sanjeevani Uh, for the last three years, every week we have been having programs, but the problem is that there are only really limited people actually access this information. Now we need to reach out to rural people. I think that requires a much more program uh, at at that community level. And uh, one of the initiatives what Nimans has now done uh, with the government of Karnataka is to kind of come up with a Karnataka State Dementia Action Plan, wherein we are collaborating with the public health system. with the department of health and family health government of karnataka and the dementia india alliance and then see as to how we can uh, take it to the uh, program uh, take it to the uh, at least rural place and also uh, in nimans we are also uh, 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 kind of experimenting with a taluk level mental health program in uh, two taluks one in uh, karnataka and one in uttarakhand so again that is with a model where from children to elderly how we can actually uh, Uh, do the implementation with from prevention to trans uh, uh, to rehabilitation lots of things are available the biggest challenge is translating from various successful models into real life practice so that is the actual change actual challenge because uh, as amit uh, was telling that uh, there are many research and uh, uh, evidence is available but how much these evidence gets translated into actual practice if you ask as a clinician who is sitting and facing uh, uh, day to day uh, problems uh, even with the best of the resources what you can have it is not easy uh, today morning i had a person who is 75 year old very uh, from affluent background uh, long term mental illness have been there as bipolar disorder he has come alone three times to the hospital uh, morning the first thing i notice him is to sit in the office and then shouting that he wants to meet the chief minister he wants to meet the minister and he wants some uh, uh, laptop to be given to him there is no sense because he is 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 uh, uh, children or uh, uh, they can provide anything but he is not willing to be uh, helped by anybody and so we had to compulsorily admit him following the mental health care act and reached out to the family we don't have the best of the elderly friendly hospital services available to help these kind of people when i have to admit i have i am worried whether he will develop a fall he will develop a fracture whether my uh, health system is safe uh, so we have a, we have to go a long way even when we ought to help we need to have a service which is available and you need to reach out to people when i call the family whether they will come tomorrow i don't know okay so these are the uncertainties I, as i think uh, uh, neena was saying about team care and how much proactive uh, uh, multidisciplinary care is available in uk i don't think even in uk they are completely happy with that system there are challenges about waiting time and how much service is available but it is well organized in our settings uh, anybody can come from anywhere and the challenges uh, are plenty okay so i think all of us have a big task in hand whether it's help page whether it is caregiver sathi or whether it is a, a ripple of change and i think uh, community medicine public health specialist every one of us have a lot of challenge for the next decade of healthy aging um, and let us put together whatever we can do as a little but unless we are able to advocate at the government level and i- interventions like uh, telemanas and much more uh, active implementation of mental health program uh, at the uh, uh, phc level is um, uh, kind of uh, it is t- taking uh, really what we have on paper gets translated into a actual program and um, we also promote awareness at a level because it's not just enough to provide service the demand for services will be there only when people are able to utilize the service uh, then only they'll be able to they'll seek so without awareness uh, it, it is just uh, cannot happen that only you provide service both has to go hand in hand so we need a public health approach and it needs uh, active involvement of government ngos the professionals academia and we have a task cut out and let us see in the next decade or so uh by the time the elderly population becomes 20% in not very long uh, we will uh, in the next two decades we are going to see this change two or three decades we are going to see this change 
uh, hopefully uh, because i think we discuss every year during mental health day i think we make small changes uh, sarthak is one initiative uh, elements and uh, help page india is collaborating we need to do more um, uh, active implementation so look forward to it in the next year uh, ritu thanks for the uh, opportunity to participate in this program thank you thank you dr sivan kumar before uh, closing remark uh, we have uh, four minutes uh, i would uh, like to take one question which is uh, open here that what are the uh, what are the mental health issues among the caregivers if there are some so it is a open question maybe uh, uh, dr shivak kumar you or uh, yeah, amit yeah. if you can uh, give a few uh, ones see caregivers as a uh, i think uh, uh, ms bhavna was telling about caregivers Uh, uh nobody identifies them as caregivers so uh, half of the caregivers are women or um, in fact majority of them are women majority of them are even older adults for when you talk of older adults spouse is the biggest source of caregiver and uh, they themselves when they provide care they are well, uh, they have uh, a lot of stress uh, anxiety depression sleep disturbances and many times their health issues get masked they don't even have time to provide Uh, attention to their health and basic needs so uh, all the mental health issues and subsyndromal health issues what you talk about because they wouldn't even actually flag the they they're so involved in the care of the uh, person whom they are caring they wouldn't even talk about it and once uh, uh, it, it's it's a it's a responsibility of other family members as well as professionals to identify these problems and provide appropriate intervention and not all of them requires medical intervention Uh, uh primarily a word of support and just asking them sometimes they break down just asking them as to how are they what are they doing are they take, having their food properly are they taking uh, are they getting time to sleep i think we can't provide uh, mental health care without addressing their basic needs uh, I, i think there are a lot of challenges in terms of financial mental health is closely inter- uh, linked with lot of social needs what they have and basic needs what they have whether it is about food shelter uh, income uh, guarantees and health systems being available I, i think we will not be able to do it without the government taking it up as a major thing and doing it government is doing there are programs but i think we need to enhance uh, uh, the implementation for providing more caregiver support in an organized manner uh, thanks uh... and uh, this is something uh, in three uh, lines if i would uh, summarize uh, the today's discussion that is the lack of awareness the lack of acceptance and the training need the capacity building of the community non specialized health workforce is could be the one of the solution to fill the gaps of mental health care services and to provide that mental health care support to the older population and the community and with this i would like to share that helpish india in collaboration uh, with nimhans has taken a step towards this and last year we had launched a program which is called sarthak which is a community based initiative to promote and uh, build capacity of common, uh, non specialized health workforce which is uh, the informal caregivers which from the community uh, the old age home managers and also the community health work, uh, health uh, workers which are 10000 numbers the number is huge but we are trying to build that and uh, through this initiative we we were we are trying to build and promote that support uh, for the mental well being of elderly in the community with all with this if we have uh, i think we are uh, closing in time and with with this i would like to say that let's all talk about the mental health and mental health is a universal human right we should always talk about it thank you so much thank you for all the panelists thank you uh, to the audiences for joining uh, miss neena has to leave early because she is in uk and she has been working and so uh, with that thank you all thank you for joining thank, thank you very much thank you thank everyone thank you, everyone thank, you. thank you very nice speaking to all of you thank you so thank much thank you bye nice meeting all the dr amit and bhavna and uh, mr nagesh mr prasad yes, everybody yes. thank, you. Thank, thank you i thank you, i learned a lot Kumar. today and i'd like to yeah. express and my we, gratitude we'll thank keep you. in touch we'll keep in touch and we are in touch with dr girish and we're working with dr uh, matthew varghese
Yeah, yeah. Dr. Matthew Varghese is my teacher, so yeah. <laughs> I'm getting it uh, the service after his retirement. Yeah, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll connect, we'll connect, uh, again. Right? We'll connect yes. them. Right? We'll connect again. Maybe Thanks. You two can share um, details. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you to the participants as well for joining today.